Hi, I'm Carl Franklin. This episode of Blazor Train is a little different from the usual code demos. Before we can start coding with Blazor and .NET 8, we really need to understand this new beast and how it changes everything. So today, I'm going to ask you to sit back, relax, pour a cup of cafe car strength coffee, and try to grok the future with me. And that's coming up right now, right here on... Wait, what is that? Blazor in .NET 8 changes everything. Within a Blazor 8 app, you can do everything that Blazor Server and Blazor WebAssembly can do, as well as everything that ASP.NET Core MVC can do, including your API layer. Let that sink in. Go ahead. I'll wait. What? You didn't press the pause button? This is huge. You need a minute to think about it. Go ahead. Okay, in order to put this in perspective, we need to revisit the basics of Blazor as it is today. So Blazor is built into ASP.NET Core. It has a powerful reusable component model that supports third-party components, lets you easily handle UI events, does full two-way data binding without a lot of ceremony. It has support for forms and validation. It does data virtualization for large data sets and it supports cascading parameters for dependency injection. You can build installable web apps and even support offline scenarios. It has this hot reload feature, which streamlines the development cycle. Best of all, you can combine c -sharp and JavaScript as needed. Now, there's two hosting models, Blazor WebAssembly and Blazor Server. Blazor WebAssembly runs in the browser, uses WebAssembly, which is a standard supported by all modern browsers. It's sandboxed like JavaScript, and the CLR is loaded in WebAssembly, which hosts any .NET standard DLL. So what are the benefits of Blazor WebAssembly today? Well, it doesn't require a server, can run when offline, even as a PWA, a progressive web app. The code generally runs faster, but most people won't notice a difference. It can be deployed on a CDN with Azure Functions or AWS Lambdas and the like. On the downside, there's a slower startup time because those DLLs have to be downloaded and put in place before your app can run. It also requires an API layer or some other transport to access secure resources. You can't access databases directly, for example and performance on lower power mobile devices might be unacceptable. Blazor Server, on the other hand, is a different beast. UI interactions are actually handled on the server, meaning the code behind button clicks, that kind of thing. Those, that's server-side code. Now, Blazor Server requires a circuit that uses SignalR, which uses WebSockets, a standard for persistent connections. The Blazor Server JavaScript library intercepts UI actions and sends messages to the server via SignalR using a very efficient binary protocol. The server will run the code and then return whatever changes need to happen on the DOM. The client then updates the DOM with just those changes. It's very efficient. So the benefits of Blazor Server include a faster load time than WebAssembly. You can access secure resources directly because you're already on the server. It's a more productive development experience, and it's great for low-power mobile devices. On the downside list for Blazor Server, it requires a server just for UI interactions. There's no offline support, and latency can be an issue if the server doesn't have enough resources, namely memory, but CPU as well. And 
the circuit can hang after inactivity, which isn't really a pleasant experience for your users. So in .NET 7, some major, major upgrades were made to Blazor. First of all, Blazor can be used in a hybrid mode for non-browser platforms, such as MAUI for mobile, Windows desktop, and Mac desktop, WPF, and Windows Forms. It also supports custom elements, so you can use Blazor components with other UI platforms like Angular, React, and Vue. This is by no means a complete list, but some other features are handling of location changing events. You can bind after a get set modifier. You have dynamic authentication requests, improved JavaScript on WebAssembly, and some WebAssembly features like SIMD and exception handling were also added. Now there are ASP.NET alternatives to Blazor. You could use ASP.NET MVC. You could use ASP.NET Web API, ASP.NET Core MVC, Signal R, which is different, but you know it's still a transport, and an older technology which isn't available on .NET Core, ASP.NET Web Forms. Some non-ASP.NET alternatives to Blazor include ExpressJS, Django, Ruby on Rails, and Spring Boot. Now, this is what you must understand. Blazor 8 is what Microsoft considers the de facto choice for building web applications in ASP.NET Core. You can create a new Blazor web app in .NET 8 and never use any of the UI interaction features that Blazor is known for. You can then add the UI features that you want as required without having to choose a hosting model at the outset. So let's go back to the idea that you can create a Blazor web app with absolutely no interaction. What can you do? Well, here's a list. Server-side rendering, enhanced navigation and form handling, streaming rendering, and static HTML generation. So these features require no UI interaction. They don't require a circuit. They don't require you to pick a hosting model, but they're baked in with Blazor. All right, let's talk about server-side rendering. In both MVC and MVC Core, the process operates as follows. Upon receiving a request, the server amalgamates markup and data to create HTML, which is then sent to the client's browser. With .NET 8, this functionality can now be executed directly within a Blazor web app. SSR is especially powerful when combined with a client-side JavaScript UI framework. For non-ASP.NET options, you have libraries such as Angular, React, or Vue. However, Blazor is built right in, so you always have the option of using Blazor UI interactivity with C Sharp, JavaScript, or both. Blazor server-side rendering, and this is really important, does not require a Blazor server circuit or any client-side specialized JavaScript code. You can make requests using vanilla JavaScript if you like. Typically, performing page navigation or submitting a form post requires a full page refresh to display the response from that request. Blazor, on the other hand, has the ability to intercept both page navigation and form submissions, opting instead to initiate a fetch request. While this still invokes standard server-side rendering, the returned HTML content is handled differently. Blazor takes the received HTML and updates the DOM smoothly applying only the necessary changes rather than refreshing the entire page. This results in navigation and form handling that are not only quicker and smoother, but also give a more responsive feel. And I need to reiterate, this feature does not require a Blazor server circuit or signal R. Everything is done with pure JavaScript on the client. Streaming rendering. When utilizing server-side rendering to generate a page, there might be occasions where lengthy asynchronous tasks are necessary, such as retrieving data from a database or making an API call. In conventional server-side rendering, the user must wait for all these asynchronous tasks to finish before the page becomes fully accessible. The response is finally dispatched to the browser, allowing the user to view the page. During this waiting period, a small loading spinner might be displayed in the browser to indicate the page is still being rendered, that's up to you. Streaming rendering provides the ability to perform an initial render of a page while asynchronous tasks are still in progress on the server. It enables you to display layout along with placeholder content where the actual data will eventually be placed. 
The usual GET request is still made, but an immediate response can be shown to the user as data continues to load on the server. Once the asynchronous tasks are completed, the component renders once more, sending a streaming update on the same response stream. Importantly, this doesn't require a Blazor server circuit as well, and it's distinct from Blazor server altogether. Instead, the existing connection established for the request is utilized to transmit further updates on the response stream. Blazor then takes care of updating the DOM seamlessly. In .NET 8, it's now possible to render Blazor components entirely outside the context of an HTTP request, and even beyond the confines of the ASP.NET Core environment. You can take a Razor component and render it directly to HTML, either as a string or as a stream, and then use it as you see fit. This capability opens up new possibilities and can be particularly useful in scenarios where you might need to create an HTML document that incorporates specific data or logic. This diagram shows an HTTP request, but it doesn't require an HTTP request or response. You can just generate static HTML from a Blazor component wherever you want and use it however you want. So all of those features I just told you about happen without any web sockets, SignalR, or Blazor server circuits. And they go a long way to take the burden of plumbing off your shoulders without having to write any specific code. Currently, Blazor offers two methods to facilitate client interactivity, Blazor server and Blazor WebAssembly. The choice between these two options for your application hinges on several considerations including factors such as the required load time performance and the specific user interface latency demands. Blazor WebAssembly tends to have a slightly slower load time since it requires the download of the runtime, whereas Blazor Server generally loads more quickly. However, Blazor Server handles the UI interactions over the network, and due to the inherent limitations in speed, such as the speed of light, there may be a slight delay from the moment a button is clicked until the component renders and the response returns. Conversely, Blazor WebAssembly executes code locally on the device, allowing for low latency operations. When considering scalability, Blazor Server consumes server resources to manage the UI, effectively trading server capacity for that functionality. Blazor WebAssembly shifts this load to the client, redistributing the burden. These differences illustrate the engineering trade-offs between the two approaches. Presently, the decision between Blazor WebAssembly and Blazor Server is typically made at the outset of a project, and this choice has a pervasive impact on the entire application. Now, the cool part. With .NET 8, the ability to incorporate client-side interactivity has become more granular, allowing you to decide what rendering model to use on a per page or per component basis. When a specific component or page requires interactivity, it's now possible to lightly integrate either Blazor Server or Blazor WebAssembly interactivity into that part. And this creates an island of client-side functionality within what may otherwise remain a server-side rendered application. Of course, if you prefer to enable Blazor Server or Blazor WebAssembly interactivity across the entire app, that option remains readily available as well. But with Blazor 8, the establishment of Blazor Server circuits or the downloading of the Blazor WebAssembly runtime only occurs on the components or pages where these features are specifically employed. If a page is not utilizing these functions, there's no associated cost or overhead. Essentially, you're only paying for these features on the pages where they are actively being used, keeping the rest of the application free from the unnecessary load. In any component or page, you can specify the render mode with an attribute, render mode server or render mode WebAssembly. This is a significant difference between Blazor and .NET 7, and it's certainly more flexible but what if you want the best of both worlds? What if you want the upfront performance of using Blazor Server for interactivity with the eventual power and speed of Blazor WebAssembly? For that, we need to look at the auto render mode specified by the render mode auto attribute. You would use the auto render mode when you'd prefer to use Blazor WebAssembly, but would start by using Blazor Server, complete with a circuit and a SignalR connection. 
Once the WebAssembly libraries for .NET have been downloaded and cached in the browser, the component will automatically switch to using Blazor WebAssembly. When using the auto render mode, you must build your components as if they were running on Blazor WebAssembly. That is, you must use a transport layer such as a REST API or a gRPC to communicate with services on the back end if you're going to access any secure resources such as databases or other API servers. So what did we learn today? Using the .NET 8 Blazor Web App template should be your go-to project template for creating any kind of ASP.NET Core app, whether or not it requires UI interaction. With features like server-side rendering, enhanced navigation and form handling, streaming rendering, and static HTML generation, you can build powerful web apps without UI interaction. When the time comes for you to implement some UI interactions, you can specify the rendering mode at the component level, even allowing components to start with Blazor Server and then switch to Blazor WebAssembly once the .NET libraries are loaded in the browser. Of course, you could also use your favorite non-.NET UI library, such as Angular, React, or Vue, with all the new features of ASP.NET Core and .NET 8. In short, this changes everything. Hey, thanks for riding the rails with me today. This is where I jump off. I'll see you next time. Blaze a train!